So we're here with Bill Holden, and you flew on Air Force One with Kennedy. Yes. And you had conversations with him way back then about your, um, well, about ET visitation in some cloaked way. Is that right? Somewhat. And I can go ahead and give you a better description of what actually happened. Uh, I was stationed in Wiesbaden Air Force Base in Germany. And this was June of 1963. And President Kennedy was on his way to do the Ich bin ein Berliner speech in Berlin. And I had the uh, pleasure of being one of the stewards on board and greeted him that morning. And President Kennedy was one of these gentlemen that he knew everyone. And so when he came on board, he knew who I was. And he says, good morning, Airman Holden. I says, good morning, Mr. President. And that morning, I had picked up a couple of newspapers uh, from the local newspapers, uh, English edition. And there had been two UFOs uh, spotted over the Autobahn and clear pictures right on the front page. And so I had them sitting on the table and I'd asked him if he would like some juice and, uh, uh, and, and coffee. And he said, uh, juice would be fine, thank you. And uh, by that time he looked down at the paper and saw what was there. And um, he looked up at me and says, well, what do you think? And then I says, well, what do you think, sir? And he looked back at me and with that, just that phenomenal smile of his, he says, I asked you first. So I laughed about that and I said, well, sir, uh, I'm, I'm an old Southern boy from down in Georgia and uh, my grandfather was a Methodist preacher down there. And for us to believe that we're the only intelligent beings in the world is unbelievable. So yes, I believe that there is such thing as um, other uh, human species as well as um, UFOs. And what so, did he say? Uh, he says, you're right, young man. And I just wish I knew then what I know now to have been able to go ahead and, and ask the president some of the questions that I have today. Wonderful. So did you have any other conversations with him as time went on? Not really. Uh, uh -huh. As you know, we unfortunately lost him in November of uh, 1963. Right. And the anniversary flight the following year, I was with his brother Robert and the Ford family, um, his wife, uh, and some of the uh, two of the children. And uh, we went back and did the anniversary flight uh, to the Ich, uh, ich Bin Ein Berliner, and then actually went. We had Princess Lee Radzivill on board, and we had the opportunity to actually go see the Radzivill estate in Poland. Uh huh. And did you um, talk to Robert Kennedy about that? No, I did not. Okay. No. So, so you just, that was basically kind of that experience. Now, did you have, I don't know, what a person on Air Force One would have in, in your position. Was that a top secret clearance or was that any kind of clearance at all? It's known as a top hat. Uh -huh. And it means it's above a top secret because you may hear something in conversation uh, on board the aircraft and whatever is said there stays there okay and that's our responsibility okay but the right. conversation between you and Kennedy you were able to kind of you've spoken about it since at conferences and so on was this a yeah. you know conscious decision of yours to come out and or, or was this because of that experience or was it because of other experiences you had that made you come forward there were there were many other experiences that occurred um, as far as uh, three particular in my military career. One happened prior to meeting with uh, President Kennedy, and that was in August of 1962. And I was down in Swybrook in Germany doing a swim meet down there. And it's a Canadian air base there. And uh, I had won my event and uh, was guest of this uh, Canadian Air, uh, air Force pilot and his family at his house. And um, uh, during the course of the evening, he says, what are your plans tomorrow? And I said, well, I was going to ask your daughter if she'd show me around Swybrook and, then, and just kind of tour the city. He says, well, I understand that you're a jet mechanic. I said, yes, I am. He said, how would you like to go fly tomorrow? And I said, hmm, go fly or go on a tour with your daughter. I looked at her and says, I'm sorry, I want to go fly. <laughs> so. We went and uh, 
We took off that uh, next morning in one of the most phenomenal aircraft that I've ever had the pleasure of being in, and it was the F-104 Starfighter. And it was the fastest known aircraft to man at that time. Uh -huh. During the course of our flight that morning, at about 10 o'clock position, I saw this weird shaped craft to my left. And I said, bogey, 10 o'clock, and what is it? The pilot looked over there and he says, don't know, let's go find out. He hit the afterburner on which just launches you at, at mock speeds, and we took off to this. Now, here we are in the world's fastest aircraft, and this aircraft, this aircraft disappeared on us. It went away so fast. Uh -huh. Well, this was my actual true introduction to what cover-ups and everything else is about, both in the military and in the public mm -hmm. and politically. Uh, when we got back, we were met by a commander, and he said, who are you? I identified myself, and he said, what you saw today you haven't seen and do not discuss with anybody. Wow. Okay. And they put me in a car and took me back to the captain's house. The captain came in like about four hours later, and he said, Bill, whatever you do, do not say one word about this experience. It will hurt me. It will hurt everything that I'm about. And I said, sir, I won't say a word about this. And I haven't until, you know, after many, many, many years and out of the service in 77, and I first started speaking in 1995. Okay, so after that experience, did you know you'd seen, I don't know, a UFO? Did you know, I mean, it, in other words, did you have any idea what it was? Did you get a picture in your mind of what the craft looked like enough oh, to tell you? It, it was, it was. Was it a flying saucer? You know? It was, it was indeed. And this was right over the Rhine River. So, wow. And we were like at about, oh, I'm going to say about 50,000 feet of altitude. So it, it, there's no doubt about it. As far as the drawing is concerned, that's a flying saucer. That's what a, we, you know, right. Colloquial, what and in the um, front page, front page of the newspaper on that morning in June of '63, was this was something a similar type aircraft, and huh. this was where the two that were seen over the autobahn. And this is in Germany. Right. This is in Germany. This was outside of Wiesbaden, between Wiesbaden and Frankfurt, and, on the and Autobahn. And they put this in the newspaper? Front page. Wow. Cover. Very interesting. So right. the Germans at that point were not, um, I mean, I don't know what the article said, but they were not really keeping this a super secret from the people at that point. That's the uniqueness about the Europeans, the Mexicans, and other locations in the world. Uh -huh. They have no problem in showing actual pictures of UFOs and experiences and telling about experiences and it's front page. It's not page 96 <laughs> in the last section. Yeah, it's not completely forbidden and right. it's not a laughing matter necessarily either. Right. right. Um, well that's, that's, that's great. Um, so moving forward in time, your next experience in the military, what would that be? That would be the summer of 1966, and I was stationed in um, Colorado Springs at Peterson Field. Okay. And I was flying for the ADC commander, and I was also providing support for the Air Force Academy. Okay, when you say you were flying, were you operating the aircraft, or were you... Uh, I wasn't a do? pilot, no. I you was. Were I was a load master and I was special air missions and flight steward. Okay. And so we took care of special missions that uh, were either with high ranking officials, international dignitaries, or uh, special missions that we were going on, such as this one. And we were taken into, in fact, I was taken in privately into a room and I met with an uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, he said, this is a voluntary mission. And I said, sir, I take every mission as a mission. Uh, you don't have to ask me what I'd like to go. Uh, you tell me, I'll go. 
And so he went ahead and he had me sign a document that was a 20-year non-disclosure agreement with full penalties all the way up to going to prison and losing all rights. And this was in what year? 1966. It was okay. the summer of 66. Okay. And what he indicated was that I was going to be flying back to Andrews Air Force Base and I was going to be picking up high-ranking military officials and um, uh, high-ranking scientific uh, individuals, okay? So uh, I agreed to everything and went ahead, planned the mission, got all the food and everything that would be required on the trip. Flew into Andrews Air Force Base, spent the night. The next morning we loaded up early and there, were, uh, there was one Brigadier General, there were a couple of colonels, and then the rest of the entourage were high-ranking civilian uh, engineers and scientists. And did you know the names of these people? No. No, I did not. Okay. It just, it, it did wasn't you something. Did recognize them? No, no, I did not. Okay. Uh, from there, we went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. We landed there, and they went to what was called the Blue Hangar. Now, a lot of people know what the Blue Hangar is about. And it was where uh, a lot of the reverse engineering was being done on UFOs that were found in, in the late 40s that had crashed. Uh, there were... Um, Are you saying that you knew this at the time? When, in other words, when you were told you are going to the Blue Hangar, you, it was general knowledge among people that you worked with that that's what that was? No, there was only a special few that knew what the Blue Hangar was about. Did you know at the time? I did not. Oh. I learned later. I see. So it was, it was really unique. So from there we flew to Colorado Springs and where our base was and they went up to uh, the Air Force Academy, they went to Cheyenne Mountain, which was NORAD headquarters and where the Cheyenne Mountain complex and where all the early warning system and and headquarters as far as for uh, missions there. And then from there, um, we left and flew to um, White Sands in uh, New Mexico. And we landed and all of us were put on a bus. And to this day, I still do not understand why we went along, okay? So normally you would stay in the, with the aircraft. We I would assume. have stayed with the aircraft and stayed on the base. Okay. And this ha this has happened both times that uh, we, as an entire entourage, were taken with the group. So anyway, we got onto a bus. The bus was blacked out in the area that we were sitting in, and basically this um, gentleman in uh, not in an Air Force uniform, but in a khaki colored. Um, uh, with a special emblem, and I can't remember the emblem on the left sleeve. And they were armed, and they had a clipboard, and each one of us had to show our military ID. And uh, then we were checked off the list, and then we were told to go ahead and sit down. We traveled probably for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then uh, I was right up front and off to the right front seat there so I could kind of see through to where the driver was and through the window there. But as far as the, um, when we, we got there we were stopped and I could see like walls of a uh, mountain uh, on the left side by the driver and then uh, and a, and a guardrail that was down and then this guy got on board uh, with another gentleman and walked through with a clipboard and again all of us had to show our IDs. From that point we were driven on in and we stopped uh, at this, uh, there was a line shack out there, we got off the bus and the entourage was escorted over to where there was a um, UFO on the ground. There were like two Quonset huts and another building, a runway, and we were inside a box canyon. And then um, uh, from what I could see, uh, we weren't able to get right up with the entourage. The crew was held back 
but basically what I was able to see was that there were two UFOs in one piece flight suit. Uh, they were probably about five feet tall in comparing to the other people around okay, them. What you mean uh, there was one UFO and there were two um, extraterrestrial ETs. beings? Correct. Okay. And they were wearing one piece suits? One piece suit, light aluminum colored. Okay. Okay. Their skin was a pale color and as um, what is typified or called a grayling is what they looked like. Okay. The larger head, the large black eyes, uh, small mouth, small nose. And is, is this uh, what they would look like or not? Uh, surprisingly, uh, very much so, but the nose is more protruding here and the lips are fuller, oh. okay? And then the other thing that, and there's an amazing story behind this piece, but as far as the back is very true to what the graylings were like, hmm. they have a musculature across the back like this. Okay. And the, um, but very thin-lipped across here. Their, their arms, very thin, and the hands were long and thin. Now I've been asked many times, were there four fingers or five fingers? And I said, to be absolutely honest, I have never known that. I never knew to look for that, didn't think about it, okay? Okay, so are you still in the bus at this time? Or are you outside? No, we're outside. Okay, but you're we're back outside. from the group. We're back from the group. But you can still see. We can see, yes. Okay. And was there any verbal introduction or preamble to what you saw? Not at all. Where, where we were put on this was the fact that um, the, the way it, it went, we were not allowed to ever discuss the mission with any of the participants, okay? And basically, when the crew was around, uh, there was no conversation going on about what was going on at the site. Were you shocked? Excited, not oh, shocked, really? excited. Okay, yeah. did any of the aliens um, exchange eye con what you would consider to be eye contact with you? No, too far away, uh -huh. okay. But basically, they were very, uh, as I said, they were real thin and long-armed, long hand, longer neck, thin, and their heads were, were larger. Uh -huh. About how tall? Uh, about five feet tall, okay. okay? But the thing that I saw is when they moved, they were very graceful. Really? Very graceful in their movement. Okay. And, uh, but that was, so that was a very you unique. a non-disclosure during that time? Was, was that, I mean, was that a non-disclosure with a certain length of time? 20 years. Oh, that was the 20-year one? Right. Okay. Okay. So we're past that time, and, and you got past that time, and then you started speaking out. So this is another incident. Did anything else happen? Yes. During that time. Now, in the fall, I was brought back in and briefed again by the same lieutenant colonel. And he said, um, same, same drill, same scenario, signed the form, I did. And uh, anyway, end up back in Andrews Air Force Base. And this time, I'm expecting to see the same people again. Totally, totally different crew. There's an admiral, there's a, um, uh, a captain, which is the equivalent of a full colonel in the Air Force. This was basically an all-Navy group with, again, high-ranking civilian uh, engineers and scientists, but none of the same crew, totally different. Hmm. But here again, we flew um, to Wright-Patterson. Here again, they went to the, to the Blue Hangar. We flew to Colorado Springs. And they again went up into uh, Cheyenne Mountain. And uh, from there, uh, we went to Los Angeles and took off the next morning and we flew to Hawaii, landed at Hickam Air Force Base. And we were told, have the airplane ready in, uh, for leaving at midnight. So we got everything ready, got some rest, back at the airplane, took off at midnight. We flew for somewhere around three hours and 45 minutes to maybe four hours, and we're flying in a C-118, or what is the equivalent of a DC-6, uh, DC okay? 
and four engine propeller aircraft and we landed and I said guys we're back in Hawaii he says what do you mean I says there is nowhere out there that we can go fly for three and three hours 45 minutes four hours and land okay physically impossible in this airplane I says Johnson Island is five and a half hours Guam is much more um, so no we're back in Hawaii somewhere so sure enough um, again in which I still do not understand is that we were all taken together and we went out to we had breakfast and then we went out to this site that's right by the ocean on the west side because the sun was coming up behind us and we're looking to the west and it's an observation deck and all of us are standing there and a little after seven in the morning about this time this craft comes out of the water from our left to our right and just goes like this and then stops out there in front of us now here again double elliptical saucer shaped craft but at the mid beam on this there's a light going back and forth like this uh, at the mid beam on it okay okay pretty much equal as far as in design top and bottom double elliptical now it sits out there and then almost instantaneously disappears so everybody's excited about what they're seeing and everything and about this time somebody yells it's back and it's now a little bit closer about a hundred yards out maybe a hundred two hundred feet off the off the water and it then demonstrates as far as going up and down side to side cants left and right then cants at an angle and goes right back into the water now when it goes into the water and when it came out of the water there was no explosion or implosion as far as it went back in and so what's what was the size of this vehicle could you estimate oh I'm gonna 100 yards out I'm gonna have to guess that this craft was somewhere around and I'm guessing I'm saying probably 50 to 60 feet overall length okay okay so it wasn't it wasn't huge no but what was amazing about this I had the opportunity later on to be able to meet the astronaut Garden Cooper and I had asked him about it and he said Bill it's uh, when you have a electromagnetic propulsion there's a force field around it it's like that craft is inside a sandwich so that when it comes out of it and when it goes back in you're not going to see the explosion or the implosion so that was that was one of the explanations I was trying to find out now, are, did, was it your understanding that that was flown by extraterrestrial beings or was that one of ours um, my understanding was that it was ETs still at the time the uh, today we have our own mm -hmm. so it could, no could have question. been one of ours um, I would say that it was probably a, a combination oh really yeah in 66 uh -huh. it was all uh, a matter of evolvement that's been coming along all the way through uh, Gordon Cooper talks about the time that he was um, <clears throat> stationed out at Muroc which is now Edwards Air Force Base and he was a major at the time and one actually landed and his crew was out there filming uh, uh, brake testing and everything with uh, one of the craft and they actually caught this craft landing and uh, the door opening and closing and then taking back off again so at this point you've seen you know you've had some really pretty amazing experiences right yes and in a certain sense you've signed NDAs but you didn't did you have what was considered to be a top secret a beyond or is this the top hat clearance that goes across the board for you at this time no that was only during presidential I and see. any time and that's one of the things when when you're in presidential service and someone says uh, they're flying on Air Force One that is any aircraft that the uh, president is actually flying on. It can be a helicopter, it can be 
the Spirit of America, which is two six thousand. Uh, so it's so okay. So how just briefly um, could you explain to us? I mean, you have to be highly, highly trusted to, I imagine, to to have the job that you had. Is this not true? It I mean, it, it required a full EBI extensive background investigation to be on presidential air crew. It also required, as far as that, uh, for top secret. And now, any of the missions that I flew after the presidential, all the way through 1974, when I was stationed in Panama, uh, I had a top, top secret clearance. Okay. So, um, it, were you a member of, of a certain armed forces? Air Force. Air Force. Right. And what was your title, your your professional title under those circumstances? I was a uh, loadmaster and flight steward, special air missions. That's what it, it's called. That's right. what your title is. Right. Okay. And did you change rank during that time? I did. I went from uh, airman second class uh, up to staff sergeant on my last, as far as when, when I saw my last encounter. Okay, and now have you told us everything that happened to you in the military or do we have another one? We have one more. One more, okay. Um, because what I would like to know after you tell me this is whether or not you feel that you have ever been called in for psych evaluation or been, you know, uh, to your knowledge, mind controlled or had suddenly told to go see the doctor on a periodic, you know, mission. Never. Never, okay. Never. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. In fact, I had a clean bill of health when I left the Air Force. Okay. Uh, summer of 1971, I'm stationed at Patrick Air Force Base, Cocoa Beach, Florida. And um, I'm, I always love to go down to the Indian River and go fishing and everything. So uh, it was a Friday afternoon and I, uh, I was going down and um, put my gear out and everything. and threw my line out and just kind of sat back. And I'd like to preface this, this statement this way. I don't smoke, I don't drink, never done drugs, <laughs> and I'm the grandson of a Methodist preacher. Okay. So I wasn't having my beer. I didn't have anything special as far as to, you know, put me out. But I kind of leaned back against the palm, and the next thing I know, I'm on a pedestal table, I'm inside a craft, I'm looking up at a dome ceiling, I don't see any light fixtures, and I have three ETs to my left hand side. Two short, one taller, and I'm guessing about five feet tall and maybe three and a half to four feet tall hmm. to my left. And the only marking in the room is up on the ceiling is this brilliant, brilliant bright blue placard with three gold stars on it, okay? Now, conversation as far as that I'm going through is all telepathic. And basically, this has happened to me twice now. Tell them to stop destroying Mother Earth. Tell them to learn to love one another. And thirdly, to take their mental and heart harmonics to a higher level. And it's been the same message to me both times. Okay, were you afraid? Surprisingly not. Surprisingly not. Well, you'd had more exposure before that encounter than most people. Well, also, even the very first one, I wasn't afraid. I was excited, mm -hmm. as I have been with all of these. And so it didn't, it didn't shock you and put you into any kind of, you know, altered state or, you know, uh, conundrum about your religious beliefs versus what you were seeing and all that kind of thing. You, you didn't have that kind of a sort of a, a break in, Not at all. in your conscious understanding. Not at all. And the, thing that I've, and the thing that I've found through all of my experiences is that I've had a very open mind. Mm -hmm. I've been one that I've been willing to learn and to share these experiences as well as because when I started the speaking tour, it was let the truth be known. 
And that's how I feel about it. It should be known. And the, um, the thing that I had out of this experience was the fact that the, I found an implant in my left arm about right here. Uh -huh. It's about not quite an inch long and about three-eighths of an inch wide. Okay. You see where I'm pushing it up? Yes. So okay. it's still there in us. It's still there. You never had it removed? No. And the thing that um, I've, been, I've been asked, why haven't you had that taken out? I said, I consider it a blessing that I have had these opportunities to be able to experience the UFO and the ET phenomena that I have seen. And in so doing, they felt it important enough that whatever this device is, that it is following me, okay? So maybe there's another, there's another time, another place that I may have another encounter. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And Richard Dreyfuss is, is, is there. And you know all the experiences that he goes through. You know all the disbelief and everything that they had talked about. But he said, let me go. And that's where I've always said, beam me up, Scotty. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so I definitely don't have a problem with that. Wonderful. Okay, so, so you've had these experiences in the military. Now, I'm assuming you've also had some civilian experiences just because of the way you're talking. Yes. Okay. But at this point, you left the military voluntarily? Not, not quite. We have, we have one more that did not involve... UFO and ET phenomena, mm -hmm. but while I was stationed in Panama at Howard Air Force Base in Southern Command, in the summer of 1973, uh, we were called in, we got a briefing that we were going to be taking a civilian filming crew because one of the astronauts, as they were returning, saw these um, hieroglyphics uh, on the plains in Peru. Mm -hmm. So uh, they wanted somebody to go up there and actually film them, the Nazca plane. And it's as the astronauts were returning, they saw this, and they of course called it in and, and talked about it. And in their debriefing, they saw this. They saw this uh, and they explained about it and took pictures of it. So in, anyway, what they did was um, uh, we went out with that crew, and we had the pleasure of actually walking the Nazca plane, physically being in the trench, 18 to 24 inches deep, and seeing this, uh, this phenomenal creation that they had done. And then also in this tour, we were at Machu Picchu, Cusco. Uh, we saw drawings on the walls of helmeted figures craft and stuff like this that were dated eons ago. And this is part of your military duty. Right. It sounds like, you know, you, you couldn't pay to get such a tour, <laughs> right? This was phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. And then in Lima, we were taken into this building that was maybe 5,000, 7,500 square feet in size. And on the floor and on shelving and everything were uh, there were uh, skeletons that were dated 20,000, 25,000 years ago. Now, you asked about religious beliefs and everything else. This is where you get into where the Bible, and we're, taught, and we're talking about being taught about the Bible, and 6,000 years is what that Bible talks about. Okay, it talks about before Christ and when Christ comes in the 2,000 years after to where we are today. The Greeks are the only one that feel that there's another 1,000 years. And it talks about, in Genesis, as far as in the beginning, man created. Okay? It went on and God created man and, and as far as Adam and Eve and all the evolution. So, basically, this raised a lot of questions, especially being raised as a 
grandson of a Methodist preacher and down in South Georgia and okay. looking at things. So I turned around and I looked at it and I wasn't disturbed by it. What I looked at was this, is that the Bible, and if I take it phonetically, it's basic instructions before leaving earth. It tells us how to live, how to get along with each other. It's a chronological history of our mankind all the way through to where we are today. That's what it's about. It's how we're supposed to live. It's how we're supposed to love each other mm -hmm. and take care of one another. Not all the war and everything else that's going on. Now, so here I'm looking at remains that are dated older. What have we found today now? We have found remains that are 80,000, 100,000 years old. We know about the dinosaurs being here a million, billions of years ago. Okay? So how, how does it say as far as today the earth, okay, many, 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 millions of years old. We've only been here for this period of time. All these other civilizations have been here before us. In, in this sense, were you putting together in your own mind with your own teachings that you got from you know, your religious background and so on, with what you had been shown, and did you just create some, you know, sort of a bridge between them that made sense to you, and then I'm assuming you did some research since then, so that this all comes together in a package. But at the time, were you given, you know, by the military, for example, any instructions or any, in other words, did they say, you know, we were created by ETs and so on no. and so forth? They no. didn't, they never actually... No. So when they showed you these, when you were on these tours, you were with others, right? Right. And did you talk to these other people? I talked within my own crew. Okay. Yes. And what was the general consensus at that point? Were people blown away? Were they like you and, and re relatively um, okay about everything? They, what, did they have a, was there a wide variance in reactions? Uh, as any time you get a group of people together, there's different opinions. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, but what I found was that I had a spiritual feeling about it. I felt that there was a reason I shared that experience, and I was exposed to that experience. I still feel that today. Okay, but did you feel that the other people there were reacting, in other words, were they buttoned down and careful not to show too much reaction because they were part of a group doing this sort of thing? There was nothing that was, oh my God, here's, you know, yeah, nothing like that. Like, they weren't falling over themselves no. with shock. No. So they were on some level with you as being... Um, here's the, an experience, the know, here's what happened in the know, okay. exactly. So, okay, so you were yeah. taken here, you were shown around this tour, and nobody explained to you, hey, you're going to be going on a tour that's going to um, change your life or anything like that, no. right? No, no. In fact, we were to never told. We were never told what the mission was about. Hmm. We were just told that the mission was classified, okay. and as far as we had to sign the non-disclosures. Did you feel you were a test subject? I, I don't know. I, I feel, here's what I think. I think that back in the time, when was the first time that we supposedly found out about UFOs in the United States? When? Well, okay, 1947. Roswell there you are. Is the, Roswell is the, is the notorious. Census. Okay. But they were here before that. Oh, yes. Okay, now, here's the thing that happened. What was causing the crashes? Because there was more than one. There were many crashes in the Four Corners. And what had happened was up in the northwest corner of New Mexico was a huge radar dome that was put up. And it was basically to protect the Southwest Corridor and to be early warning. Well, what happened was that every time that turned on and as, av as the UFOs flew through it, they were all of a sudden thrown kittywampus and everything and thrown out of control. When was that built? Uh, that was built in probably the mid-40s, 44, 45 probably after the uh, 
uh, Pearl Harbor. I see. Yeah. Okay, well, I understand that it is said that radar took down those UFOs. It did. Okay. Um, did you have any exposure to actual crash scenes? Were you brought out on crash scenes at all? No, was okay. not. Okay. In Did you share stories with other people in the military who were? No. Have you talked to Clifford Stone, for example? Uh, probably at the conference, okay. But not inside the military? No. I was long gone out of the military before I ever spoke one word. It was long past my 20 years. Okay, so tell okay. us why you came forward. Um, I felt that it was important that the world knows that UFOs and ETs are true. They are real. But was but there an you, incident? You asked, a que you asked a question, though. I want to go back to All right. it. Because you asked... Um, were we a test, okay? Uh -huh. You know what I think? I think that I can look back on that now and the basic, because I've been, always been trying to figure out why were we taken along on both instances? And I think what it was, is the public ready to know about UFO and ET phenomena? They wanted to see how we reacted. Well, you reacted I, very well. Why haven't they come forward? You know what I'm saying? Because that was one of the things that came out in the 50s, okay? And that's why... Um, so, but this was after the 50s. This is after Project Blue Book. They're still testing. They're still trying to find out. Exactly. They had a great reaction. I don't know about your other, you know, fellow crewmen, so to speak. Um, any ideas why okay. since then? Can we hold that question? Sure. Because if we can, I want to walk you up to this, because in 1996 and 1997, I'll have your answer. Okay. 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 So you're out of the military. 1977. And what in 1978, I'm living in California, and uh, I'm up in Lancaster, and uh, I have been invited to go out for a tailgate party. And we were going out to a place called Mars Hill, which is out in the Mojave Desert, close to Edwards Air Force Base. And they said, if you want to see crazy things at night, you've got to go here. So we're all out there, and, and uh, we're having a barbecue, and we're, we're watching things. And, and about this time, we had been commenting on some of the light formations and everything, the way the planes were craft were flying around and said, that's nothing that we make that can do that. And we're laughing about that. And then, all of a sudden, this girl had just this beautiful, real long red hair. And it is straight out, like one of these things that you hold the <laughs> electron thing over. Okay. It is straight up in the air. And she's pointing up and she is screaming bloody murder. Going over the top of us is a craft the size of a football field, rectangular in shape, moving at slow speed toward Edwards Air Force Base. Incredible. Okay? We bail. We get out of there so fast it's not even funny. Okay? Did you feel the electromagnetics on yourself? Did not. Oh. But the next morning, I got up and I go in to shave and I, whoa, I am like I have a big sunburn. Anywhere that was exposed on me was just like a so sunburn. So you were living close encounters of the third kind. Now you are Richard Drivers, right? <laughs> what happened was that we, of course, called everybody, okay? And so, of course, I went down uh, to my doctor and everything, and he says, um, and he checked as far as to make sure that there wasn't any radiation. There was no encounter as far as radiation goes. And he said, it looks like there's no skin damage, but where you were exposed, give it a week, let's see if it goes away. And sure enough, a week later, it's, everything is back to normal. But anywhere it was exposed, it was this, this better than burnt red. Okay, did you have a sense that that was one of ours, or that was... Uh, Definitely easy? not ours. Okay. Mothership. Uh -huh. Okay. 
And um, President Eisenhower in 1953 or 54, one of the two day, two years, he's president elect and he's out at, um, I believe he was out in Palm Springs and he was getting ready to play golf. And all of a sudden, he said, I've got a toothache, I need to go see the dentist. Now, instead of going like about 30 miles over to Riverside and to the Air Force Base there and going to see a dentist there, goes all the way to Edwards Air Force Base. Now, history says that this is where he met the ETs and that a, uh, an agreement was signed between the U.S. and the ETs. And as far as that, uh, a mothership was seen coming in, there were a number of UFOs coming in, and that the base was literally shut down for three days. I have been able to find that the base was shut down for three days. I've been able to find in civilian records, newspaper accounts, everything else as far as that those, those facts were validated. Okay. I have never been able to find the base historian. I cannot find out that he's living or dead. He's disappeared. Hmm. I can't find him because there's a lot of information that that's somewhere. Okay. Okay. Now, from that point was where a number of experimentations took place, and when you hear about the ten thousand cattle that were massacred. Okay, and nobody could explain how all these different things happened to them. Okay, well what happened was it was laser testing. And it was everything from being mounted on helicopters, on jeeps, on trucks, on tanks, and backpacks. And it was the only way that they could test it without testing it on human beings. And that's what that was about. When we got into where we were talking about reverse engineering on the craft that was brought in from the 47 crash at Roswell and other locations. This is where we get into the transistors. This is where we get into um, electromagnetic propulsion. For, the, for our purposes, you've now told us about a civilian sighting that you had that was pretty outrageous. Right. Now, these people, were they friends of yours? Were they also in the military? Were they ex-military? No, this, this is local friends in the area. Mm -hmm. And they were not military? Of no. Not at you all. did not know them in the military. No. Okay. Okay. So, so at this point, you're you're pretty much an old hand at this, right? I mean, for all intents and purposes, you've been around. So now you've had other experiences since then. Yes. Okay. You want to tell us what those are? <laughs> okay. In the fall of 1991, I'm living in Silver Lakes in Helendale, California, and I'm driving home, and it's in the evening. It's a clear, clear night. And as far as there's no clouds that I can see as far as until I turn off going into Silver Lakes off of old Route 66 between Victorville and Barstow, about halfway. As I'm turning in, I see this one little cloud across here, and I see these large kind of orange-colored orbs not coming down from them, but going up into the cloud, okay? So I park and I watch this. Uh -huh. Now, I'm trying to judge how big these orbs are because I'm sitting in the car and I'm about a half a mile away from the site and it's about the size of my thumb at that point. So figure half a mile away, the size of my thumb, how big is this orb? It's pretty big. So anyway, I see that. Now, in... So nothing happened? Nothing Did happened. I missing, just... No missing time? No missing time. Okay. I didn't go away. And <laughs> here it is. Now, in 1993, I'm still living there. And I'm leaving with my wife to go in to Victorville to go out for a night's entertainment and everything. And I'm pulling out of the project, and all of a sudden, I see this huge, bright light in the sky. 
and I'm thinking, oh my God, there's a plane exploded or a missile exploded and everything, whatever. But there's this huge light and all of a sudden it just doesn't go away. It starts pulsing. This light is going in and out like this. And then so I take off and going on the Hellendale Road going out toward 395 and this thing is starting to move to the west and I'm speeding up to over 100 miles an hour and it's pulling away from me and so it starts going like this and it's getting faster and all of a sudden it goes whew, just like that and it's gone. Your wife now, saw this at the same time. Right. right now at that point I called the Sheriff's Department, I called FAA, I called Vandenberg, because Vandenberg is where they had the missile shoots and stuff like that. Vandenberg said there was no missile shoot, and it went on, you know, as far as I contacted everybody I could. Did and any of them say that they'd seen anything that had shown up on radar, that sort of thing? No. Okay. But as far as that in the newspaper the next day, it talked about it. Okay. It talked about the bright lights and everything. So, um, so at this point, had you come, started going to conferences and speaking out? Interesting you should ask that. I had not even thought about talking about this. Okay. Okay. Till 1995, I get invited to a classified conference. They even change my name, give me tickets, different identification, and I fly in to Northern California and I'm taken to a place called the Alisal Ranch. And it's a conference that later you'll find out that it was put on by the Rockefeller Foundation. Bob Dean was there. Really? Okay. Two KGB officers were there. There was a Russian pilot there, uh -huh. astronaut. There was uh, the lieutenant colonel that his father uh, owned the ranch in Roswell that found the stuff, oh. that kept some of the stuff and buried it. Uh -huh. So that was brought out at the conference. Okay. And when they brought out this one piece that had come off the craft, it was like an I-beam, miniature I-beam, very lightweight, and it had hieroglyphics on it. And we're talking about it, and I said, this looks familiar. There's something about this, and sure enough, Two of the characters matched the Phoenician Sanskrit. Okay. Okay. So that was that was. That's an interesting link. That was an interesting link that we looked at there. Um, you didn't call Zachariah Sitchin or anything to tell him what you'd seen, huh? No. In fact, uh, I don't know whether Zachariah was there or not. We had one of our own astronauts there. We had two naval officers there. We had. Um, Air Force officer there, and a number of industrialists, and uh, but this thing was treated so classified. I thought that the president was going to be there. That's that's how much this was talked about. Okay. Well, so were there any congressmen people there? Don't know. So why do you think you were invited to this classified gathering? I mean, you'd already been in the know. You'd already been in the military. What? What was the purpose? I think somebody f knew that I had had some of these experiences from the military. Okay. Because I hadn't gone public. Right. Had you talked on the phone about this? Nope. What about surveillance? You think you were? Sur you think they had an eye on you electronically? Not till later. Not okay. Well, computers were they around in '95? I know they were around in '98. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, doing anything. Nothing on computer. No. What What was your civilian job at that point? I worked for myself. As? I was a consultant. I was in real estate. Uh -huh. But here's what was interesting is because in 1996, I went out and with a couple of friends, drove around the Skunk Works, Lockheed Skunk Works, just outside of Hellendale. It's two miles square. Right. Okay. And everybody talked about that. Oh, it's just a, a radar testing facility. I said, no, it's not. There's something about this. So I drove all the way around it, and then we went into this one area. And outside the fence, I found this rock 
and a bunch of other rocks that had been burnt with high temperature. And you can see where this part right here, okay, you can see how that was in the dirt. Uh -huh. Now, picture this being in the dirt, and that's what was exposed, and this was how much heat was on this rock. And okay. this was in the mud. So, and this is in a circle that's about 36 feet in diameter, okay? And I have a picture I can show you where this little girl is picking this rock up out of the mud, okay? And then these are around it. And then there were alkali deposits at six different, six or eight different points in the circle that were about this big around. And that if you actually stepped onto it, you would have gone down in it maybe about 18, 24 inches. Mm -hmm. It was like the ground was all broken loose mm -hmm. right there. And so that was found right there by the site. Now, what was interesting about this was that this picture right here says trespass, loitering, forbidden by law, trespasses are subject to prosecution, private property, no trespass, Lockheed Corporation. Now this is all the way around the complex. These signs are posted. Okay. Now we're driving around and this Jeep pulls up there and it's uh, got armed security officers on it telling us to get out of there. And I said, I'm on the civilian side, you're on that side. You can't tell me what to do. So what was interesting about this was this, this is the antenna that's out there by the runway. And I called it a runway. Now, I, <laughs> this is the alkali that I'm talking about and these deposits were like six spots around the circle. Okay. Okay. And as far as the hole that I was talking about, because I stepped into this, and this is how I knew that anywhere that, that kind of an alkali area was, that the ground underneath it had been disturbed. You've decided somehow, some way to come forward. Okay. Following, following the conference at, um, at the Ellis Hall Ranch uh, was when I received a, a personal invite uh, to go to uh, Mesquite and talk at the um, International Conference, UFO well, Conference. Okay, but did you know someone there? Why did they know to contact you? Uh, they, were at the, they were at the Ellis Hall Conference. And this individual that puts on the conferences really? and everything was, was there. one of the people there. One of the people there. Very interesting. Do you mean the International UFO Conference? Yeah. Bob Brown? Bob Brown. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So Bob Brown is, is certainly in the know at this point. Right. And uh, so he had invited me to come to this conference. Uh -huh. That was my introduction to public speaking and going out and talking about UFO and ET phenomena, let the truth be known. Okay, but did you at that point need convincing? Because Bob Brown, I'm at, you're at this ranch, you're talking to all these people, you meet Bob Dean, I assume you guys shared stories. Oh, we knew each other from when we were stationed in, oh, in really? Europe. Ah. Because okay. I was flying for uh, General Gabriel Disaway, and he was working, uh, he was the command sergeant major for the commander of USRA. Okay. Very uh, interesting. In well, we just did Paris. an interview with him, so that's why oh, I'm asking Bobby. you. He's How a great is he guy. doing? He's, he's wonderful. Oh. He's, a, he's a beautiful it man. It's a real privilege to meet him. Please yeah. tell him uh, I said hello because I've okay. lost contact with him. And would you oh, yeah. to provide you with his details? I'm oh, sure I would love, I'd love to know how to get a hold of him again. Um, have you had any kind of threats? One time only. Uh, I had come back from my um, talk in San Diego, and this was in 19... 96, I believe. Uh, it was either 96 or 97. And I'm living in Victorville. And it had to be 97. So I'm living in Victorville. And um, this black Ford pulls up in front. This guy about six foot two, all black. 
gets out of the car, comes up to the door, and <clears throat> I open the door and he says, Mr. Holden? I says, yes. Uh, I'd highly suggest and recommend that you change your public speaking subject. I said, um, do you have a warrant for my arrest or a presidential order or something telling me that I can't speak publicly anymore? No. I said, sir, then I suggest you go back to your car and tell whoever told you to come here, stay out of my business unless they've changed the Constitution and where it says I have the freedom of speech and the liberty and the right to go where I want to go and do what I want to do. Okay? And he took a step toward me. About that time, I pulled out something from behind my back and I said, you have 30 seconds to get to your car. And I'm serious. So he turned around and I've never heard anything since then. But the, um, I have openly, openly, spoken about this and will continue to do so and anyone that would like to have me as a speaker it's just a matter of contacting me and you can post my email and phone number and be able to do that okay, okay? well you're you're a brave man um, obviously they were not able to intimidate you D have you ever talked to other presidents besides Kennedy no I mean I served with uh, President Kennedy, President Johnson, President Nixon. And, and, and neither Johnson nor Nixon? Uh, had, never. You had no reason to Johnson talk was about a horse's this. butt, and uh, I was only with Nixon uh, on the pre-flight uh, to his China trip, and then that was it, and then I was out of the presidential. Okay. Did you have reason to believe that Kennedy was murdered by a uh, conspiracy? Uh, I will put it this way. Our president of this United States was murdered by our own people and for uh, three specific reasons that, that I believe. It was not Oswald. Oswald had nothing to do with this. He was the pansy. Right. Okay. And three reasons which were... I'd, I'd rather hold that. Okay. Okay. Um, I have an interview that I did with Colonel Gordon Cooper, USAF NASA astronaut, back on... October the 22nd of 96. We had become very near dear friends. Uh, he was stationed uh, as an astronaut down at uh, uh, in Cocoa Beach and I was stationed at Patrick and my last mission was uh, the Apollo 13 mission. Really? And uh, I was um, working there and working with uh, special air missions and also special events whenever they were doing a launch and uh, helping dignitaries. Wonderful. Well, so so he, he was a very interesting man. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Wonderful man. Okay. In 1997, this is November the 12th of 1997, and if you look up in the upper left-hand corner of the newspaper, and this is the uh, Evening Gazette. This was the number one newspaper in the northwest of England and this was talking about the conference now anywhere else in the United States they would never do a front page even talk about UFOs let alone give you a full page article so this is in England this was in England in November of 1997 and you went to speak, I'm assuming, as part of a conference or, or something else? Uh, it was to speak in a number of locations. One was uh, I spoke in Manchester, I spoke in Lytham St. Anne's, Blackpool, uh, at uh, Cardiff by the Sea in uh, Wales, and then over in Dublin, Ireland. Okay, but why 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 did they invite you? Uh, because they wanted the latest. At that time, I was... Uh, one of the latest subjects talking about UF and uh, UFO and ET phenomena. I see. Okay. So, so you've got they've got a picture there of you and your the the uh, carving or or mask, whatever you want to call this. Okay. Now, the interesting story of our friend. This is Al the alien, and I was at of all things the state fair in Victorville, and up on a shelf. There were three of these heads. 
Now, one thing was that upon it, uh, looking at this, I found it to be rather unique that it was very close to what a true gra grayling was. So that whoever had made this head knew what he was doing. And what told me that was the fact that the musculature across the back of the skull, it was very true. And Okay, the, but I'm going to interrupt you here because you've told us that you've seen you've seen grays yes. on a few occasions. Yes. But but did you actually see the back of their head or yes. how do you know this? Yes. Oh, you did. Okay. Yes. And that's why I said the, the things that's wrong about this was the fact that the nose is too large. It was just a very small protrusion. And the mouth you don't have really lips, but just a straight line, almost a straight line across okay. and everything. But this was uh, very unique and somewhere on here, it may have worn off now. No, it says that this was done by L. Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, was who did this. Uh -huh. So, very interesting. Now, do you feel like um, there is more to the story than what you've told us here? In other words... There's a lot more. Okay. And this is because you have personal experience with, with other things that you haven't brought up here or because you've done research? Research. Research, okay. Research and talking to very knowledgeable people, engineers that have been out, worked at Area 51, uh, people who have worked in the tunnels, huge tunnel system in the United States. Okay. And, and is this like tunnel set system set up, do you think, for anything approaching 2012? Or do you think that these are areas where they are simply have underground bases that are, they are doing reverse engineering, housing various ETs? I think all of the above. This has been wonderful. You Thank are you for a the wonderful um, speaker. I appreciate you coming here today to talk about Project Camelot. My pleasure. Thank you.